Hello, everybody. My name is TJ Martin, and um, I'm the VP of Research and Development with a company called Abstracts, and I'm here to talk to you today about a new class of compounds called canisulfur compounds we've identified in cannabis. But before hopping into that, I'm going to give a brief background as to who is Abstracts. Abstracts is a, broken up into two companies, Abstracts Tech and Abstracts Labs. Abstracts Tech is our terpene flavor house, and our Abstracts Labs is a California-licensed hydrocarbon extraction facility. The reason it's important we have both these facilities is because with this, um, with our licensed facility, we're able to not only research cannabis in a legal manner, but also with our flavor house, we have the flavor expertise to recreate and validate some of these analytics we're seeing. And so we wanted to know is, what are the chemical origins of the gassy, skunky aroma in cannabis? And what are the potential impacts that may have on the cannabis industry? So why do we care about this? Consumers, this is a potentially desirable aroma in cannabis. It can be perceived as a potential quality metric in specific products, as well as it may influence purchasing decisions. Um, for, so if you're a producer, this would be important to you because you're looking to potentially increase that aroma potency in your flower or even extract products, which then leads to making decisions of optimizing your extract products and your extract processes, but also drives those packaging decisions. Depending on how you package your product may influence the retention or loss thereof of these volatile sulfur compounds. For non-consumers, this could be a very undesirable aroma and even considered a, um, a potential nuisance odor. And so as for policymakers, they would have tasked with trying to have odor control and redu reduction strategies, potential health implications, whether positive or negative, and other zoning implications. We really want to start answering these questions and tackling these problems if we understand the chemical origins of this aroma. So cannabis, as we all know, has a ton of different flavors and aromas to it, everything from gassy, floral, spicy, herbal, skunky, even some of the more exotic new cultivars that have uh, more papaya, tropical, berry, citrus aromas. If we look into how the weight distribution of secondary metabolites in cannabis, how it evolves, we have, you see cannabinoids, by far the highest weight percentage, and it's currently mostly THCA as far as, far as cannabis goes. Due to breeding practices, that's why it's so high. We also have other, other compounds such as flavonoids, uh, fats and waxes, and then lastly, we were interested in this, which is the aromatic compounds, which breaks into terpenes and then flavorants. And the reason I just wanted to show this figure is not only to show the wide diversity of secondary metabolites in cannabis, but also the fact that, as you can see with these flavorants, such as the can of sulfur compounds in the bottom, it's a very low weight percentage compounds, which does um, present potential issues with detection limits in um, gas chromatography and other analytical instrumentation. So traditionally, the scent of cannabis has always been prescribed to things like terpenes. So when you look at things like beta myrcene, it's very fuely, like a chemical fuel, spicy, woody, limonene is very citrusy, lemon, limey, linalool is very floral and sweet. But none of these have the sensory descriptors of skunky or gassy that we were looking for and interested in. And so we wanted to look towards nature for inspiration. T since terpenes really don't give that specific scent, it has to be something else. And so we look at other botanicals like garlic, durian fruit, onions, as well as animal species such as skunks. And their more pungent aromas are coming from uh, other volatile sulfur compounds. It's led us to believe in cannabis. It's possible that its, its pungent, skunky, gas aromas are also coming from uh, sulfur, sulfuric compounds. And so we had to develop a, and use a special type of gas chromatography equipment called two-dimensional gas chromatography, or 2DGC. Benefit of this over traditional GC that you would see in the lab, a traditional cannabis testing lab or a lot of other testing labs is it has an increase in separatory power so you can see more compounds as we'll go over in the next slide. This is also equipped with three detectors that are analyzing simultaneously as compounds are being eluded from the GC. It had a mass spectrometer for identifying 
the structure of the compounds, a flame ionization detector for quantifying, and a sulfur chemiluminescence detector for quantifying specifically just the sulfur bearing compounds. So we can start looking for those needles in that haystack. Just to kind of give you an idea of the benefit of why we went with 2DGC, here on the left we have what a traditional one dimensional chromatogram looks like, has very well defined peaks, but you only have maybe 20, 30 compounds in that specific chromatogram. Now you could develop this method out further and can get better separation, but you're still gonna have to deal with co-elution from similar sized compounds. Whereas when we go into the two dimensional space, we're able to separate not only by molecular size, but also polarity by having that second dimension column, which allows us to see now two, three, 400 different compounds in a single run. So as you can see, going from a one dimensional system, two dimensional system, we're able to identify vastly more compounds and start looking for what are these specific flavorants causing that skunky gassy aroma. And now to just to demonstrate why using a sulfur chemiluminescence detector was so important to us, if you look at the top plot, that's what an SCD looks like. You only see the sulfur bearing compounds, which has in that specific plot about 10 different compounds. Whereas when you look at the bottom, we have hundreds. Now since they're alluding at the exact same time on our system, we're able to overlay these plots and start pulling out the exact volatile sulfur compounds, solve those structures and determine what makes these specific, this strain smell the way they do. And so what we decided to do is we procured 13 different samples from the California marketplace of varying different ages and different aromas. We, we also procured two, spe two specifically that had zero skunky gas aroma. That was Gouda Berry and Blackjack for our controls and Boccio Gelato, as well as other varying OG and exotics to give it that, that had that skunky gassy aroma. And we put this through our internal sensory panel and had everybody rank this from how pungent and how gassy and skunky this was perceived. So we can start correlating this and looking for trends in our data to identify if there are any particular compounds of importance. And what we saw was we, on top there, we have Boccio Gelato, our most skunky and gassy, as well as Blackjack on the bottom, which is the absence of a skunky gassy aroma. And we found was there was a trend in bottle sulfur compounds three and five in particular, but also there was a complete absence in almost all the volatile sulfur compounds except for VSC1, which is dimethyl sulfide. Dimethyl sulfide is common in a majority of plant species. And give us, we then identified the structures of these. Um, the most important were 3-methyl 2-butene-1-thiol and 3-methyl 2-butanol-acetothioate. These are the ones we saw the greatest trends with in the data, in the most closely relating to the aromatic um, score that everybody was giving. Something important to notice is when we were looking for direct trends in how things were changing, we saw that prenylthiol or prenylmercaptan changed the most with, um, with the organoleptic scores. There's a much more linear trend to that. Whereas prenylthiol acetate was more so present when the sample is perceived as gassy and skunky, but when it had a no gas and no skunky scent to it, it was completely absent. Then we looked at terpenes as well to see if there's any particular trends of terpenes, and there really wasn't. It was just kind of all over the board, which is what we were expecting going into this. And something interesting we've been looking into, uh, Nick Jaicom's group has been looking into different cultivars of cannabis to relate different um, major terpenes and what their potential classifications could be. And we started looking into that um, paper as well and seeing if there's any correlations with ours. And something we noticed is that the terpenylene, myrcene rich cultivars, we've really never seen any of these cannabis sulfur compounds present. These include things like jack error, different haze types that really just don't have a skunky gassy aroma, and we really don't understand or know why these terpenylene rich strains lack cannabis sulfur compounds. We just know that they do lack it. Whereas terophylline limonene and myrcene pinene rich cultivars, like your traditional or your more modern exotics, as well as your traditional OGs, do have a lot of cannabis sulfur compounds in them. So now we understand that prenylthiol, um, prenylthiol acetates that are volatile sulfur compounds are what are the result, for, result in this skunky gassy aroma. 
wanted to know, like, well, what is this? Now that we know this, what can we utilize this for other meaning in the industry? And so something we noticed, because we use garlic as that initial inspiration, the, gar the volatile sulfur compounds identified in garlic, we, that same structural family, we saw something very similar in cannabis. In garlic, we have allele thiol, you have prenyl thiol in cannabis. Where you have di allele methyl sulfide, you have prenyl methyl sulfide in cannabis. Where there's diallele sulfide and diallele disulfide in garlic, you have diprenyl sulfide and diprenyl disulfide in cannabis. And what's important is these garlic auto sulfur compounds, that's what gives garlic not only its flavor and aroma, but also a lot of its potential medical benefits. So it begs the question, do these auto sulfur compounds you've identified in cannabis have some other potential medical benefits in cannabis? Second one to see, how do these compounds change as a function of plant growth? Do these, are these there throughout? Does this have an increase during different stages? And how could they potentially change during curing and storage? And so we did an in-house in um, grow trial using gelato with our cultivation manager, um, Ryan, to see this and capture this data. And what we saw is all the volatile sulfur compounds weren't really detectable until about week seven of flowering. And it's important to note, we only monitored during flowering. And then it really didn't start getting a large concentration, noticeable amount until about weeks 10 and 11, which is when we started the drying process. Then after from weeks 11 to 12, which is one week after storage in a traditional um, mason jar container, we saw huge decreases in the majority of these volatile sulfur compounds, including prenyl mercaptan. Nextly, we want to know how, is, do you detect these in cannabis extracts? So cannabis extracts tend to have, are done using butane hydrocarbons, what we used here. One to see is, do these make it through? Um, what we notice is that all the, the, the volatile sulfur compounds we were looking for in gelato do make it through. We worked with um, Mario Guzman, also as Mr. Sherbinsky on this, to see that all of them did make it through in Boccio, Jello, and Aussie berry gelatos. And specifically, prenyl thioacetate was in the highest concentration of all the, the volatile sulfur compounds, specifically in the extracts. Next, we wanted to take this and find a way to relate this to a consumer that wasn't in a scary nomenclature. Very cognizant that chemical compounds to traditional consumers may sound scary, right? Prenyl mercaptan, prenyl thioacetate, um, diprenyl sulfide, these aren't very um, consumer friendly terms. So and to relate something that means something to a consumer because they are making purchasing decisions where they know this or not at the dispensary level. And so when we took our data from our same sensory panel, we started looking at the chemical concentrations of these compounds we're identifying to see and start if there was a linear trend or any type of um, consumer trend we can pull out of this. And we noticed is that right around 50 nanograms of these volatile sulfur compounds, we start having and basically when it starts becoming like a turn on effect where it was that skunky gassy aroma and it really started peaking around 200 nanograms. But what's really important is that even though the perception of that skunky aroma may not get a higher perception at higher numbers, maybe slightly, that does then give you potential longer shelf life because you now have more volatile sulfur compounds present. So as it's off gassed and you start losing those compounds due to transportation, storage, even how long it takes to sell through at the dispensary level, the product going to that final end consumer is still gonna have that aroma and flavor that they're looking for. Some of our ongoing research is we're still looking at other different cannabis cultivars to understand what makes them smell skunk or different, different flavor notes and uniqueness, looking more into other volatile sulfur compounds. Just because we understand what makes gelatos and OGs unique doesn't mean we understand everything about this plant, right? There's hundreds, if not thousands, of different cultivars out there, and so we really want to understand what makes each one unique. And so this is just one example of a different cultivar known as meat breath. As you can see, there's well over a dozen different compounds. Some, some are known, they're in the, a normal NIST mass spec database. Others are newly identified or still structurally unknown. And a lot of these challenges are due to the fact that these are such low concentrations, you can't always necessarily detect them and it requires other types of 
techniques to enrich them on your GC. And so in conclusion, we've identified a new class of compounds correlating with that gassy, skunky aroma of cannabis. These are all in super low concentrations, but they have big aromatic impacts. Their concentration is in round of part per billion or part per trillion, which does have that issue with detection limits. Um, we see an increase in these can of sulfur concentrations at the end of flowering and curing. We do see them make it through into different types of extracts. And some of the future work was we really understand is what are the potential medical properties of these? Do they have any? Is it good or bad? Is there any impact on the entourage effect? What is the genetic explanation for why some cultivars produce these compounds but others don't? We see this in a lot of OGs and gelatos and not modern exotics, but not really in any terpenaline rich like hazes and jack hairs. Why is that? Is there a genetic reason? Is it some other reasoning for why it's not produced? And what other possible can of sulfur compounds in cannabis that we've yet to detect? These could have potentially really important impacts for flavor, aroma, but also medical or potential mood enhancement of the experience of cannabis. With Alex acknowledged, uh, my team, uh, Ian, Marcos, Ryan, and Kevin from Abstracts did a lot of incredible work on this. Big shout out and thanks to Abstracts for funding this and always encouraging and supporting us with publishing our research and making sure we get it out there to help educate the community. Um, thanks to Anthony Buchanan with Marx International and Sepsolve Analytical. They worked with us a lot on the GC work on helping develop some methodologies as well as thanks to Josh Del Rosa, Josh D. Maya Guzman, Mr. Shabinsky from the cannabis industry for really helping get us some of those iconic cultivars that are important for the skunky gassy aroma. And with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you so much. Uh, it's actually very interesting to, to, to hear that it is not all about terpenes and files. And it's quite contrary to, to what widely is believed. So amazing work. Um, you briefly mentioned about the genetic um, um, mechanisms or, or genes that are controlling this kind of, and probably you're going to work on that. Could you please, uh, if, if there is any uh, work that you have done or any idea of how, how uh, genetically these uh, specific aromas might be controlled? Thank you. Yeah, with genetically understanding that, I, we really don't know, right? We know that certain cultivars that are rich in myrcene, beta-crophylline, limonene, pinenes do produce these can of sulfur compounds. So that's things like Think of any type of exotics, wedding cake, gelatos, runts, skittles, those classic OGs all produce can of sulfur compounds, but traditional hazes, jack hairs, and those almost like those traditional sativas, to be honest, really don't produce it. And we don't do a lot of genomic, well, we don't do any genomics work. I know medicinal genomics obviously does that, but we focus a lot on understanding the volatile secondary metabolites. I would love to understand it, and that's one of the things we hope to find out with through collaboration someday. Sure. Following on from that, I think the key here probably has to do with the ecological role. Uh, they're not there for our enjoyment. Um, so, uh, you know, perhaps uh, an ecologist would have insight into why the plant produces these and may also provide insight into what role they could have for consumers. Totally agree. Every, all these secondary metabolites are produced for usually some biological function or other, right? Um, maybe some for pest deterrence, maybe other benefits. It could be even a decomposition product due to some other process, right? Like in hops, we see their polyfunctional thiols um, come from the degradation of different amino acids like cysteine. That's a possibility here. It's a very reasonable possibility. I would agree with that. Sure. Very good. Thanks. 